Welcome back, ladies and gentlemen, still with you and today's edition of Arab Affairs. And we're now delighted to be joined over the telephone by our guest for this afternoon, Dr. Khaled Asayed, our political analyst, who will be joining us. Dr. Khaled, a very good afternoon to you, sir. A very lovely afternoon to you as well. Thank you. Thank, Thank you very much for your time. And let me start uh, by asking you the latest escalation in the Gaza Strip. Just overnight, hundreds have been uh, killed and wounded by the Israeli occupation forces strikes on the Gaza Strip. How do you see the situation on the ground now as we speak, Doctor? Um, well, we, we've seen an escalation in strikes, not just um, last night, but over the past uh, couple of days, um, particularly since South Africa brought its case uh, yes. or announced bringing its case to the ICG. Um, so, um, so in that sense, we're seeing more and more um, what they call herding of the population, displacement of the population, more aggressive attacks um, in, a, in, an attempt, in a clear attempt to, to finish the mission that Israel has set out to start. Um, which, which is far-fetched from its, from its announced publicity that, that they're just trying to attack Hamas, but rather trying to um, obliterate the Gaza Strip um, entirely. Absolutely. Now, obviously, the, the Ministry of Health in Gaza said in a statement today over 135 Palestinians were killed and 312 wounded over the last 24 hours. We're talking about over 23,843 Palestinians being killed and over 60,000 uh, injuries and wounded, uh, aside, of course, from the people still not recovered from under the rubble. The situation on the ground, the humanitarian situation, is extremely uh, dire and uh, unprecedented, really, when it comes to any attack or war on another nation. How do you see uh, the international community's response and to these really large numbers that do not seem to be dwindling down? Well, we, we need to define what, what we call the international community because the mm -hmm. international community is used to be based on, on the UN, or used to be led by the UN, mm -hmm. which has been brought to a stalemate right now by, uh, by Israel as well as, as the ultimate backing of the US. Um, so we're seeing the UN Security Council really unable to make any decisions whatsoever. Uh, we're talking about four months now into the conflict um, and into the war on Gaza, and, and we have seen zero um, decisions that are worth mentioning from the UN uh, Security Council. Um, there have been lots of attempts from the Arab bloc to, um, to circumvent this and go through the UN General Assembly. Um, however, these are not mandatory uh, requirements. Um, we've seen a couple of, of European countries walk back on their initial claims. Uh, and their initial support for uh, for Israel, um, specifically when we're talking about Slovenia, we're talking about uh, France, uh, Belgium. However, um, when we talk about uh, the US, UK, uh, Germany in particular, um, they still have absolute support for Israel, um, which is honestly speaking, um, it, it walks back on their entire narrative of promoting human rights, of fighting for peace and stability and, and caring about the region. Um, it just sets out forth um, you know, the double standard, the clear double standards that they're dealing with um, when it comes to the region here. Um, so honestly, we haven't been seeing any, any consensus um, around, um, around supporting Israel, except from these, from these three countries um, in a blanket agreement and a couple of island states. But, um, but when we talk about the majority of the world, I think everybody is, is becoming clear that you know, they're running out of talking points right now. They're running out of, out of uh, ways to defend the situation uh, that's happening. The number of dead is simply unjustifiable. The number of children that are being killed, the famine that is happening there, the health crisis, the, um, the intentional blocking of aid um, to, to reach the Gazans is, is simply um, undefensible. You know, there's, there's no words to justify it. Absolutely, sir. Um, now, speaking, you mentioned, of course, the main powers that are not uh, opposing uh, directly the situation and the aggression uh, by Israel. However, on the other side, we have other countries like South Africa. South Africa has taken a great step uh, at the International Court of Justice. We've seen yesterday the second day of hearings uh, into the case brought by South Africa in front of the court, accusing Israel of committing a genocide uh, in Gaza. How do you see this uh, move by South Africa? Um, a very courageous move. Um, it, it talks about principle. 
they have presented an extremely airtight case, um, provided a lot of evidence um, to support their claims. Um, naturally, the, the ICJ um, uh, ruling will take will take a while. However, adding the, the adding a request for provisional measures um, to expedite uh, a, a, an immediate ceasefire um, is a, was a very smart move from South Africa, um, to say the least. Um, they, it shows that they were talking from conviction as well. They have yes, been they it. also have their own background of apartheid. Absolutely. Absolutely, and being accused of apartheid from um, from from South Africa is mm -hmm. is a statement on, on its own. Um, it's it's not an Arab country that brought this to the ICJ. So 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 the talking point cannot be that you know it's, it's the Arabs against Israel. Mm. It, it it leads the international community. Of course, a lot of countries have joined South Africa in its case um, and have supported it. Um, of course, and we've seen also that that. In opposition, um, Germany just released a statement uh, yesterday, I think last night, um, saying that it will um, it will try to block the case um, and support Israel's case, which, which absolutely makes uh, utter no sense. You know, it doesn't make any sense at all. But um, but of course, given Germany's historical background and um, and their their their, their um, defensive uh, stance against Israel um, is, is sort of understandable from their from their own background. Absolutely. But um, but the case from South Africa is airtight. Um, we expect the ruling to be there within within a week or two maximum on the provisional measures, which will shift, which which has the potential to shift the entire narrative of the Palestinian case, um, because if provisional measures are are imposed by the ICJ, that means that a lot of people who have supported Israel will be liable um, against legal action in their own countries. And we're seeing also another case brought to the Federal Court of Justice in the U.S. Um, against uh, against the Biden administration for their support of uh, of genocide right now. So so we, this has a trickle down effect in into internal politics of a lot of nations right now. Absolutely. Uh, still, uh, I want to you know stay with the with the court case, and we've seen uh, a lot of allegations as well at the International Court of Justice. One. Uh, allegation against Egypt, which Egypt has slammed, uh, saying uh, the Israeli allegation that Egypt was responsible for blocking aid to Gaza uh, from the Egyptian side. And we've seen the head of the state information service, Diar Oshwan, saying that Israeli officials, including the Israeli prime minister himself, Benjamin Netanyahu, repeatedly said they, they are the ones not allowing the aid uh, into Gaza, specifically the issue of fuel uh, passage. And of course, Egypt only has sovereignty over its side of the border crossing on the Rafah side, uh, whilst the other side in Gaza is subject to uh, the Israeli control. How do you see uh, these unfounded allegations against Egypt at the International Court of Justice by Israel? Well, I mean, it, it doesn't come as a surprise. I mean, since the beginning of the conflict, and actually, if you go back, we can go back 20, 25 years to, through, through this conflict and, and say that um, Israel has repeatedly lied through its teeth um, and, and try to flip truth around, try to spread misinformation, disinformation um, to a widespread campaign, um, specifically since October 7th, um, trying to appear as, as you know, as, as the, the, the people that are defending themselves when they are the aggressive. Um, and so, so actually, it is a fact that, that Israel was, was in fact boasting about their administrative measures um, in controlling the aid and making sure that they that they check truck by truck, um, we've seen um, we've seen trucks have to travel a distance of 70 kilometers back and forth just to go through Israeli um, checking and, and and checkpoints before they are allowed to enter Gaza Strip. So I mean I mean I, I don't think that this is um, this is this is not going to have a bearing on the ICJ case because the facts are clear. And they are documented, and and as you've said before, um, they have been announced by the Israeli uh, government themselves, you know, by Israeli officials themselves. Um, for 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 over a month and a half, we have been discussing with the Israeli government to allow more aid in. The U.S. was involved in this discussion, so it was not Egypt that was that was stopping the aid or was blocking the aid. Um, on the contrary, we we just have access um, um, through our side of the border, bearing in mind that the Rafah crossing is meant not for such amount of aid to go in it is meant for for people uh, it's, a, it's a it's a civilian crossing uh, border crossing it's not meant to transport this amount of trucks and um, so the fact that they have blocked in all the other uh, crossings 
um, and close them down, shut them down, um, just simply speaks to it for itself, you know. Absolutely. And Egypt, as you said, has gone out of its way, not just to get aid across, but also receive uh, the injured Palestinians, uh, provide medical care and services uh, for as many as the Palestinians uh, as possible. Let me ask you uh, another issue related to uh, the International uh, Court of Justice and the hearing. Uh, what do you see the best case scenario coming out of this hearing, uh, in your opinion, Dr. Khaled? Um, an immediate provisional measure should be taken in place um, right now, calling for the immediate cessation of hostilities, calling it what it is. It is a genocide um, by, by, all, by all measures of international law. Um, once this is put in place, this activates the entirety of the Geneva Genocide Act which basically says, uh, states that um, you know, any, any country should do whatever in its measures to stop this. Um, this will make liable anybody providing uh, funding or weaponry to Israel, which would, which would immediately cause a rollback in, in U.S. policies. Um, because just by that, just by provisional measures being put in place, um, as I said before, it makes the U.S. administration liable um, within the U.S. system. Um, for supporting genocide, which is not something that the Biden administration wants to go through right now, um, specifically when we're talking about uh, re-elections and everything coming up, um, and, and the weakening position within within the U.S. government, right now, within the U.S. Um, uh, popularity right now, within the polls. Um, so I think that this is going to have uh, a lot of countries roll back on their on their plan. And um, it should push forward in immediate talks for peace. Um, because because the ultimate goal of this is a two-state solution. That is that is something that we should not forget. Um, but then again, comes also the question of reconstruction after that. What is what is the plan for the day after? Uh, so once once there are no more uh, hostilities in place, um, what is the plan after that? Um, with Hamas staying in power, um, how do we rebuild all that destruction? You know, we, we, we're talking about 85% of Gaza being destroyed right now. Um, there's a lot of suffering, there's a lot of medical needs, hospitals have been destroyed, houses have been destroyed. Um, so, so we will need to, have to mount a, um, a very um, strong international effort for rebuilding, for reconstruction, uh, if we are to get anywhere. Um, but, um, but I think what's happening right now is the U.S. is walking a very fine line between trying not to escalate this into a regional conflict, um, just by being there, um, while providing its support, its ultimate support for Israel. And I think that what's happening right now is they're having tougher and tougher discussions, um, but they realize that they're not getting anywhere with the Israeli government. So eventually a change in government is going to happen and is going to be pushed forward by the U.S. Um, from what I'm seeing. Right. Indeed, we'll have to leave it at there for now. I'd like to thank you very, very much, Dr. Khaled Zaseir, our political analyst and our guest for this afternoon. Thank you so much, sir, for all your time uh, and your insight on today's edition of Arab Affairs. And uh, in other news, the United States has carried out a second strike against the Yemeni's uh, Houthi forces, continuing an escalation, threatening a wider conflict spilling in the region. We have more details. The United States carried out a second strike against Yemen's Houthi forces on Friday, continuing an escalation that threatens a wider regional conflict seen as a spill of the Israeli war in Gaza. The latest strike, which the U.S. said targeted a radar site, came a day after dozens of American and British strikes on the iran backed group's facilities in five cities. The U.S. Central Command said in a statement that the guided missile destroyer Kani used Tomahawk missiles in the follow-on strike early Saturday local time to degrade the Houthis' ability to attack maritime vessels, including commercial vessels. The Houthi movement's television channels reported that the United States targeted Yemen race. The group swore retaliation and continued threatening of Israeli shipping in the Red Sea in support for the Palestinians who are under bombardment and siege by Israel in Gaza since October the 7th. 
Meanwhile, U.S. President Joe Biden warned that he could order more strikes if they did not stop their attacks on merchant and military vessels in one of the world's most economically vital waterways. The U.S. carried out additional strikes against the Houthi forces after Biden's administration vowed to protect shipping in the Red Sea. The guided missile destroyer used in the follow-on strike was to degrade the Houthis' abilities to attack maritime vessels. The Houthi movement's television channel, meanwhile, reported the U.S. and Britain were targeting the Yemeni capital, Sana'a, with raids.